Okay. Got it. Thank you very much for the message. <laughs> Data protection above everything. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this event. Uh, my name is Aitor Gonzalez. For those of you who do know, don't know me, I'm the Delegate of Action for Equipo Europa in Andalusia. Uh, well, it is my pleasure to present to you this event on European integration. Uh, we have two fantastic guests. Uh, we have here Damian Buselager, if I pronounced your surname correctly, and uh, Lara Volters, which is uh, arriving shortly. So thank you very much for, uh, for taking the time to attend this event. Um, since Damian will be starting, I'm just going to give a, a small presentation on, uh, on uh, his work in the European Parliament. Okay, So he, he's a German politician. Uh, was elected in the European elections of 2019 for the yeah, political. For the political party Vote Europe, uh, which is part of the Greens and EFA parliamentary group. Um, he has been serving as a member of the uh, Committee on Constitutional Affairs and the Delegation for Relations with Canada. He has also worked for the Committee on Budgets, Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, and the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age and the Delegation for Relations with the United States. And lately, he has been the Parliament's Rapporteur on the Budget of the European Union for 2022. So thank you very much, Damien. I hope I am not missing any anything important <laughs> from this description. Um, no, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, I think you uh, you covered most of the everything. I think there was one uh, little mistake that I will forgive you, which is that you called me a German politician, <laughs> and uh, I would uh, say that I would rather see myself as a European politician. But I come to that in a second. I just apologize. Uh, uh, no, it's, uh, that's not your fault. That's more like my. <laughs> Peculiarity, I guess. But I just saw that uh, Lara also joined. Um, oh, did she? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I can start uh, still, Lara, if you want to get a minute to settle in. But if not, uh, feel free to also, um, you know. I'll take, take a minute up. to settle in. Hi, okay, Lara. Very good. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you too. <laughs> so okay. basically, Lara, I think what we decided is that uh, we would just do a, like a rather short intervention, uh, quick, basically, you know, in German, we call it an impulse for track, like, <laughs> like yeah. you know, getting the discussion started and then, and there are like some people here in the score and then we can just have a bit of an open debate about uh, European topics. And that's what I think I just said. So I'll start. Um, then, I mean, you described a bit like, um, you know, what I'm currently doing in the European Parliament, but obviously, um, for me to be in the European Parliament in the first place is a bit of a, a coincidence. <laughs> I would say like it's a bit random um, because I didn't actually plan to go into politics. I was uh, working in the private sector and then um, yeah, I started a master's program. And in this master's program, which was in the US, I um, yeah, basically fell in the middle, in, into the midst of the uh, you know, Trump and Hillary Clinton campaign at that time, um, which was a bit shocking because then obviously Trump won and I was there when uh, Clinton lost. It was in the campaign center of the Democrats, which was, was a bit uh, stressful, to be honest. And then also it was just in, you know, after the Brexit referendum had happened. And so we were like, I was a bit shocked overall about, you know, the situation of rising right wing populists uh, all across the world and also in Europe. Um, because at that time, Marine Le Pen was running her campaign five years ago against Macron. Um, equally or maybe a bit less strong, but still equally uh, dangerous. And um, and then in Germany, we had the AfD and so on. So there was all these right-wing populists basically there. And um, and then like an Italian friend said like, hey, you know, I'm going to found an Italian party. You shouldn't found a German one. I was like, no, I'm not going to found a party. Leave me alone. But then in the end, uh, somehow I got stuck. And um, we uh, he was always, you know, running ahead. And so I tried to um, organize everything a bit um, in, in uh, behind him. And then a French uh, friend joined and then somehow uh, the idea came up that we should, you know, build a European movement as the counter um, balance to like the rising right wing populists. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what we did. And then, you know, two years later, as you said, um, I was elected out of Germany. A vote actually ran out of seven countries uh, back then uh, for the European elections. My goal is now in uh, two years that we run out of all 27 countries for the European elections. I think that would be absolutely fantastic as a signal. You know, how many seats we win, we will see. But like um, to just like have this European party signal, I think would be really cool. Um, and we are currently in the Dutch and in the Bulgarian parliament, uh, which is, I think, uh, actually um, um, 
it's, I don't I don't know if this qualifies as a Guinness World Record, <laughs> but like it's at least it's a, a new thing that you have with the same party, um, the same name, and the same program, whatever, in 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 two national parliaments. So that already makes me quite happy. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, in the I mean I could talk for hours about the. the stuff that I find interesting in the European Parliament, but I think I will keep it a bit more general um, so that we have more time um, and just say that, look, what what made me become active in politics um, then five years ago uh, was exactly this feeling that we are a bit at a crossroads between you know, Europe falling apart, or is uh, they would positively put it a, a Europe of the nations basically driven by individual governments that try to solve e the issues that they have amongst each other with a bit like a medieval congress coming together with the heads of state and then you know somehow forming their opinions and um, or this other option which is basically saying like look we will have a european democracy where you have european ideologies fighting like a conservative uh, idea for europe fighting against the social democratic europe and so on and then you have a bit more like this european let's say yeah, with ideolo ideological interests uh, fighting. And for me, this this second option is so much better than the first, because the first one basically means that you have like these 27 countries or how many countries you have um, blocking each other constantly because national interests will override uh, other thoughts about, you know, ideological thoughts of how you can solve issues. And it will be extremely inefficient and bad. And so if these, uh, you know, right-wing populists wouldn't, or like let's call it uh, nationalists, um, wouldn't be also often a bit racist and, uh, you know, somehow, yeah, let's have a, have a very negative view on the world. I mean, the the idea of the Europe that they want to have is not crazy. Yeah, it's it's not crazy to think that it could be a system. Um, where you have basically governments somehow coming together to, to solve the issues. I just think it's completely dysfunctional and it's not able to solve the, the topics that we need to solve on the European level together. And you have so many examples of that. I mean, the European asylum system we don't have since 2016 because the governments can't align on it. The sanctions, okay, the first level worked quite well, but now you can see already because Hungary is so close to Putin and or like at least Orban is so close to Putin and you have, I don't know, even Germany, which is completely stuck in its uh, gas dependency and so on. So they block each other for their national interests and therefore, I think, block the European interest as a whole. And that just doesn't work for me. And so I think, I mean, this idea of, you know, should we fight for more European integration is my main driver. And I think we really need to get that. So that, this would be the beginning. I mean, you said it, I work in... Uh, the Constitution Committee, where I do like conference on the future of Europe stuff and electoral law. I work in the Industrial Policy Committee, where I do data policy um, mostly. So there are like two acts: uh, the Data Governance Act, Data Act. Um, I work in the Budget Committee, where I do uh, the recovery fund negotiations and also like thinking about you know new recovery funds now to deal with the sanction effects. Um, and I work in the Interior Committee, where I do mostly um, stuff around migration and asylum. And, and so that's basically like the palette of uh, work that I'm currently doing. But I think um, I will leave it now to uh, Lara to, to, to take over for her ideas and what to do. Maybe one last point I, that I always uh, forget, uh, that, but that's super crucial, is I think in this kind of crossroads thing, um, and that's why it's so cool that you're here, and that's also why I would love to speak to you, is I mean, it's really not defined in which direction we go. Yeah? Will it be the Europe of nations or will it be the Europe of uh, in parliamentary democracy? And that's why it's crucial that we understand that we all have a role in this. And that's why you also have a role in it. And I'm super happy that you already get active. And I would uh, yeah, encourage you to you know, join any party that is democratic uh, to make sure that it goes in the right direction. Exactly. Well, thank you very much, uh, Demi, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do the same. It's going to introduce Lara. Um, she can give us a, you know, her general point of view. Then I have one question for each of you um, to get, you know, kick started the discussion, uh, and then we can, you know, start taking uh, questions from from the people. I have here a few questions as well, there, you know, and we start uh, the discussion. So, uh, Lara, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm just uh, gonna give you the quick introduction of who she is. Uh, she's a Dutch politician of the PVDA which is the Dutch uh, Labour Party. Uh, they're also part of the Social and Democrats Parliamentary Group. And she was also elected in the European elections of 2019. She has been serving 
as a vice chair on the Committee on Legal Affairs and on the Committee on Budgetary Control. She has also worked in the delegation for relations with China, the Committee on Internal Market and Consumer Protection, and the delegation for relations with the United States. She's also a member of the European Parliament Intergroup on Anti-Corruption and the Responsible Business Conduct Working Group. Lately, she has been the co-rapporteur on a 2022 directive on improving the gender balance on boards of directors of listed companies. So, Lara, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you. And um, thanks for having us. I, I see a lot of people here. I don't see many people with their camera on. I always like it when people do turn their camera on because I think it makes for a little bit more of a lively discussion. And if you are uh, chopping up uh, ingredients for your dinner at the same time, then there's no problem in that at all or shame. Although I suppose in Spain, it's it's not uh, it's nowhere near dinner time yet. It's a bit, but, it's a bit um, early for that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, Dutch, uh, the Dutch person in me has uh, revealed itself already. Um, I think Damien started with um, that it was a bit random that he was in the, the European Parliament uh, now. And I think the same goes for me. I got in uh, by uh, surprise. Um, there was absolutely no way that five years ago or uh, three years ago, I should say, I would have thought that I would be a member of parliament now. Um, in my case, what happened was I worked in the European Parliament and I thought um, if there were people in my, my, my party who were young, who were female and who knew about Europe and cared about Europe, then I would know them and I just don't see them. And therefore I felt I had this obligation to go and campaign essentially um, and to go and help in the campaign. But I didn't think that that would then turn into um, actually becoming a member of parliament because in our case, what happened was that Franz Timmermans at the very, or a, a very late in the process became the head of our list with, which then um, meant we got uh, the, double the seats that, that we'd had previously. Um, at the same time, I should say, um, it, was, it was slightly more complicated than that in that I grew up in Brussels um, and my father used to work for the European Parliament. And uh, as a child, I would, um, I would be there quite often um, and I would sit in a chair across from him and make a drawing or I would walk through the, the corridors in the, the high heels of, of the women who worked with him who would let me. And I didn't really understand what happened in Parliament and I was too young to be able to follow meetings, although I always tried with the, with the headphones. But what I saw was energy and what I saw was something that excited me. And I saw that there was a, a project being worked on by a lot of people who seemed very busy and there seemed to be a lot of interaction between them and, and that intrigued me. And then later, when I went to a, an international school, to the European school, um, and I, I, I had, had classmates from, from all over Europe, um, to me, um, the excitement for Europe as a whole came and the, the normality of working together with others um, when thinking about things like, um, like climate change and so forth. Um, and so I think that those things together, you know, me being being intrigued by the parliament and then at, at you know, probably 15 or so starting to recognize the importance of the of the European Union um, made for for quite a, um, a natural path to to Brussels for me um, to, to start working there, because um, even though I said when when I when I started studying that I wouldn't go back to Brussels because I knew Brussels already and I was going to do something completely different. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course, I ended up there because, of course, you know, um, to me, the, the the seeds had been had been sown for for um, for an interest both in politics and in the European Union. And one of the things I found very important in the European campaign was making clear that there are differences in Europe between the different parties in the European Parliament and that the idea of Europe or where Europe should go, um, those ideas are very different when you look at parties on the left versus parties on the right. And yeah. in the Netherlands, um, you know, very often the, the sort of slogans in campaigns that are used are, you know, uh, my party thinks that Europe is more than, a, than, uh, than, than money and than market, um, i.e. Um, we think that Europe needs to not only be um, a market that works well for companies and that is that is handy and nice to have, but that there needs to be 
um, the social conditions also for us to to um, be able to protect those who um, who are unlucky, um, those who who need more help, and so forth. And that well, a lot of member states, of course, think that issues like that are national competence. That if we don't at European level enshrine some of those um, uh, those 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 minima, those floors into our European project, that what we'll get at the end is a caricature of of what was intended and is something that works well for those with with power, with connections, with money, uh, those companies that, that can use the market, i.e. the bigger ones and the biggest ones, um, but doesn't really work for, for everyone else. And I think there's a danger in that because if people feel disconnected and if they feel that Europe costs them money um, and, and doesn't really deliver for them, um, then I think you see a rise in the polls for, for extremist parties. And um, it's, of course, all more nuanced than that, but that is that, that feeling is something that, um, that made me think I, I, I want to campaign and I want to make clear what choices people have in Europe, because I think very often when people think about Brussels and think about Europe, they think that, um, that Europe is, is, is one, um, that you know, it's a sort of black box and we don't quite understand how it works, but in that black box, decisions are being made about, about us and about the future of Europe. And, um, you know, and when they come out, um, that's, all, that's all done and dusted. And of course, what happens in, in Brussels is there's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's different institutions, or there's, there's different countries, and there's different you know, political flavors, if you will. Um, and, and all of those compete with each other and there's a huge tug of war going on on many important topics. Um, but I think towards the outside world, often it looks like Brussels equals maybe the European Commission. And I think that the European Parliament itself is also not adequate enough in showing what the differences are. Um, and often uh, between members of Parliament um, or towards other institutions, I think there's this, this, this misguided idea of since the outside world is already quite critical of Europe, we need to close the ranks and we need to uh, we need to not be too critical about Europe and about Brussels ourselves. Well, whilst I want to be quite critical of the Commission president, um, if she makes a proposal on sanctions that doesn't go far enough, or if she sends text messages to uh, the, the directors of, of large pharmaceutical companies to go and close deals. Um, so I think that, that that parliamentary culture in a way needs to needs to change, but this is something I wanted to talk about in the, uh, in the campaign. Um, you said it uh, already, I'm on a, a number of different committees, but very concretely, my biggest project this term is a law on uh, responsible business conduct. And what that is concretely is a law about making sure that businesses take responsibility for their value chains when it comes to human rights, the environment, and things like government governance and, uh, and corruption. Think of anti-money or uh, money laundering, uh, think of bribery. Um, but also uh, human rights, uh, the rights of workers in, in textile uh, industries, for instance, or in, uh, in, in, in minerals, um, in, in the agricultural sectors. Um, there's a ton of examples that you see every day when you open the newspaper of corporate misconduct, um, shell polluting uh, rivers in Nigeria, uh, a steel company in my, my country polluting the sea, um, there's a, a fantastic documentary on Boeing chasing profits and in the process uh, making uh, airplanes that, that kill people. All of those things, I think, in 2022 um, should be in the past. Um, and that's what I want to make a law uh, about. And it should be a law that, that uh, stops allowing companies to look away and that forces them to take an interest in what happens in their value chains. Um, that's my big project. And I'll leave it there and looking forward to, to hearing from you guys. Okay, thank you very much for that, Lara. Um, well, um, one of the things that uh, you mentioned, um, I think both of you, is that um, you know Europe as a whole feels like uh, Brussels is there and the rest of the people is on the other side, right? We feel this kind of disconnection, and this is one of the reasons why we, uh, you know, we are in this association because we want to feel closer to Europe and especially as the youth, you know, we don't feel heard by our politicians, so that's why we get involved in all of these uh, you know, defense events and projects, because we want to say, hey, we're here, you know, listen to us, because at the end of the day, we are the future and we want to improve the Europe we live in. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you both working towards that. Um, to start the discussion, I have one question, which will be the same for the, the both of you. Uh, our, because you start the last, then I can ask you now, Lara, first. <laughs> um, this question is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to talk about in the, the integration of Europe. Um, I know you both have been involved in many committees, you have done a lot of work, but which 
which uh, project would you say is the the one that help the help most towards this goal of the European integration? So which project which project you have been involved that has the goal of improving the European integration and getting us all closer? And this could be from any point of view. It could be economics, law, equality, uh, environment. You know, whichever thing that you project that you worked in, which one do you think helped the most towards the the European integration? Hmm. It's a tough question um, because I think European integration is, you know, it's 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 sort of academic topic, but it's also, of course, something that happens every day through very you know, boring things like deciding together that whatever we're going to take away, you know, an extra barrier for for bananas to, to be able to circulate, you know, between the different member states or whatever. I mean, it's a random example, and I don't think it's even true. But, you know, there's 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 a very concrete and boring examples of, of how Europe is integrating. But there's also the big ticket things that I think matter. And for me, I would say, even though we're failing at the moment, um, the biggest thing I would say is is the the, the rule of law. I mean, the budgetary control committee, um, and that committee, um, I think it doesn't play its role well enough in in uh, the European Parliament. But that's a committee where, in principle, we need to check uh, EU money that flows to the different member states. And we know, of course, that there's a number of member states, and Poland and Hungary included, that use European subsidies. Um, to go and bribe people, to go and fund election campaigns that are then anti-European, that go and fund projects of friends of friends and so forth that have nothing to do with the intended goals. Um, and via that committee, I became interested in the, the, the rule of law discussion because it's also a committee uh, that co-authored the rule of law mechanism. And that's a mechanism that, that we invented. It's a law that we invented that basically says that is, if there's a danger to the European budget because of the, the rule of law situation in the member state, that we should be able to take action and ultimately close the, 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 the tap of European money flowing to that country. And that's something that um, I'm, I'm involved with. Generally, rule of law questions um, are, are extremely important and, and in different ways, I try to uh, to get involved in that, for instance, by saying now that the Commission has waited far too long with using this law, um, why haven't haven't letters been sent to Poland and Hungary to say we're now starting an official procedure against you? Um, how is it possible that we might be transferring money of the the COVID relief fund uh, or the RF to to a country like like Poland? Um, but the reason I mentioned this because your your question was you know what what single project is helping most in European integration? I think that if you don't do these things and if you don't call out problems within the EU, even though of course you could say well better to to sh you know to not talk about these things too much because you will create an anti-european sentiment but i actually think it's the opposite i think that if you don't talk about these things and if you sweep them under the rug or if you say yeah but there's already so much euro skepticism let's not go and mention you know all our problems let's let's not hang out our, our dirty laundry as we would say in dutch i think if you do that then people who are going to mention these things are uh, extremists are populists and they will say look um, Europe is everything you expected it to be. It's people lining their pockets. It's taxpayer money disappearing. Um, it's it's European money being used for senseless projects or random train lines to the village of uh, of, of autocrats. Um, and I think that if that happens, you have an even bigger problem. So I would say the rule of law is uh, is the, the biggest contribution, even though at the moment we're not uh, we're not succeeding very well yet. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Damien, so which is your project that has been working more toward the European integration? Um, yeah, um, so I think, I mean, I could talk about, you know, the um, Corona recovery funds because they economically helped obviously to bring or to keep Europe together in the times of, uh, of severe economic downturn. But I won't do it. <laughs> um, I think the, I mean, the one topic. So I, first of all, I, I agree with Lara that, like, obviously, you know, as, as long as the European Union is functioning and putting out legislation that helps integration, because you legitimate the European level as being functioning, and then obviously people think that it makes sense to have a European Union in the first place. So every little piece of legislation, in in a way, uh, supports European integration. Um, but obviously, I mean, Voigt's idea was from the beginning also very similar to what Lara said in terms of like addressing the issues about fixing the EU. And it, I mean, that was like the main first chapter of our program was to fix the EU. And what we meant by that is definitely trying to also change the system um, a bit and, and not only the legislation. And so 
I think the two things where I'm having the most impact in that uh, election promise, if you want, is um, the trans, or let's say the electoral law. So I just negotiated the electoral law and it's going to be being voted in, in the European Parliament in uh, two weeks, and which makes me very happy. And then it will still need to go through all our beautiful national capitals um, to be you know, agreed. So this, this will be difficult, but at least in the proposal we make from the European Parliament side, um, we said that you will have not only your first vote for your national party, but you would also have now a vote for a European party, a second vote. And that for me is an absolute dream if that becomes a reality, because that means that you have exactly that, what I said earlier, and a chance to vote for the conservative Europe, for the social democratic Europe, for the liberal Europe, for the green Europe or whatever it is, you will have concrete candidates behind that and you will have a program next to that. And so you will directly vote for European political parties. And I think that is um, absolutely amazing. And so that for me would be, I think one of the projects. Uh, it could be that, so since the Conference on the Future of Europe is currently happening, I don't know if you know it, it's a very opaque structure, but <laughs> some yeah, citizens are involved. <laughs> and so we are, we are um, involved, yeah, we're involved yeah, in that one as well. <laughs> very good, that makes me very happy. Um, and so I think, I mean, one, so I'm there in the working group democracy, and one thing that we reached um, is to write in the conclusions that the treaties uh, need to be changed to take the citizens' uh, recommendations into account. So that means that if we, in, and that's also in two weeks, actually on the 29th of uh, April is the final uh, session of this conference, that if we get this somehow through, and there's some plans of how to do that, uh, then we could actually trigger a convent to change the European treaties. And this has already been done. So we, in, in the AFCO committee, we have uh, asked the bosses of the parliament, the conference of president, to uh, basically allow us to trigger Article 48, which would be a treaty change. Um, and so if this conference now, end of this month, uh, goes the way that we want to, uh, then the European parliament in less than two, three, four, five weeks, it will trigger the process to actually change the European treaty. So that obviously would be a, a quite a big wow. uh, change in terms of um, where we want to be. But let's see, uh, we never know in politics, you know, <laughs> if somehow <laughs> Le Pen wins this weekend, then you can scrap these whole ideas and you can put them all on the side and uh, then pray that I don't know what happens. Um, if Macron wins, then maybe, you know, other countries will come together trying to stop this process. So it's always, always uh, open. But I think these are, if you ask me, uh, these are the things that, that uh, contribute to integration the most, I guess. Mm, okay. Well, okay. thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I agree. Politics are very difficult <laughs> and unpredictable as well, as we have seen in the last few years. <laughs> but they're also a lot of fun. Huh? And you should definitely, uh, as I said, oh, yeah. um, you know, go into parties because our democracies still work via parties, um, mostly, if you want to actually actively, you know, uh, create things um, and not only vote, which is also very important. So I, I would still say um, it's really cool that you do the civil society perspective. I think that's also equally um, valuable, but also I think, you know, think about uh, renovating your parties from the inside because uh, since the 1980s, party membership has halved across Europe and that's really shitty. And um, so we need to bring people back into parties yeah. so that we have a functioning democracy. Yeah. And that's a, a, another one of our goals is to get the you know, young people in, particularly in Spain, more involved in um, you know in European affairs again because uh, as I mentioned pe before, people feel disconnected. They feel like uh, you know politicians are up there and we just down here and we just you know don't connect with them. Um, I think we need to you know to get um, young people to to get involved in politics again. Um, now, uh, thank you very much for answering this question. Now it is question time for everyone else. Now, I have here a list of questions of some of the members that could not attend, but still wanted to discuss this. And since we are recording this, well, they will be able to see on YouTube another day. Um, the way this works for everyone attending, you have two ways of uh, you know, uh, interacting and asking the questions. You can either raise your hand, which is the option is down there. OK, you turn the camera on and then you ask your question. OK, and we can discuss it. Or if you're a little bit shy, no problem. You know, you can put the question in the chat, English or Spanish. I can translate, no problem. Uh, and then we can also discuss it. OK, um, so while you are uh, thinking of this question, I'm going to drop the second one. OK, uh, but I hope the next the third one will be one of you guys. Um, and this question could go to anyone. OK, um, based on the recent events and you can choose whichever you want, uh, COVID, Ukraine, you know, or Brexit, you know, the, any recent events. Um, do you think uh, these events are um, helping in a way towards the European integration or they are 
disintegrating Europe, you know, separating more Europe. Um, yeah. I thought if uh, there's no question yet, I have one for Lager. Um, <laughs> but maybe it gives people the time to, to think. But uh, if not, if I mean, if you have a question for people to raise your hand. Um, Lager, my question is like from this meeting this morning, and maybe you can explain a bit what you organized there. Um, what did you take away? Yeah, for also, I, I have to say my brain is a little bit fried because uh, it was quite a marathon of a, of a day and my, my son woke up at six in the morning. So uh, you, you might have to repeat the, the, the mechanism for the, for the questions, but um, uh, and let me know if I need to pass on a question to someone else after this. Um, but um, it, yeah, for, for Damien's question, what I took away from that, gosh, um, we met I can maybe so this give morning... a bit of a uh, like a background. So basically, Lara yeah, had a really cool uh, meeting with uh, three Ukrainian MPs, um, uh, which I oh, found wow. um, very interesting to have. Like basically a direct conversation, not via the media, you know, not via Twitter, not by, like, but actually like a direct face-to-face -face conversation with people who told you a bit what their perspective is on what Ukraine needs right now from Europe. And it was super mm -hmm. insightful for me. I mean, many of the things I've, I guess, heard in a way, but like to have them clearly prioritized and to have them turn them out there is, is super helpful. But I just was wondering a bit uh, what, what you felt um, and then I can also yeah. give my perspective then. Yeah, yeah, I think there were, there were, there were two things. I think um, emotionally, let's say, I think there was intellectually and emotionally. And emotionally, I would say, I was just amazed that to you know, very, um, uh, I, I don't even know how to say this, the, 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 the women that we spoke to looked like they could be colleagues of ours in the European Parliament. And of course, when there's a country at war, and when you know that bombs are falling, and that every night um, that, that, that the alarms go off, and that um, people are, are losing family members, and people are displaced internally, and it's, it's chaos. To me, it was baffling to see um, you know, the, the, to meet these two members who were very calm and collected and put together and looked like they were going about their business exactly in the way that we in the European Parliament go about our business. And I suppose this is um, something that we as young Europeans have never had to think about, you know, the reality of war. And when I thought about it, I thought, oh, yes, that's that thing that you always read about in books that even in the war, life goes on, right? And that even in wartime, people held parties and, you know, very funny little details. But one of the, the, the women we were speaking um, to, um, her nails were po polished very nicely. And I thought she went to, a, to someone who gave her a manicure because even in wartime, life goes on, right? And so it was this sort of emotional reaction to, ha, huh, um, you, you, uh, you know that, that, that awful things are happening and that there's atrocities and that there's too much for any brain to be able to process. And yet these women are, are keeping a cool head and, and thinking, how can we help our country and reach out to others to tell our story, which was about rebuilding the country afterwards? Um, and, 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 you know, how can we make sure that we keep it together so as to be able to do our job? And I was very um, impressed with that. And, and it was a an interesting thing to see because of course luckily we haven't had to deal in Europe with you know the reality of, of war for a really long time um, so emotionally I suppose that was my my reaction and, and then intellectually I thought it was very interesting to to, to think about how um, how you know where Ukraine goes after this because what they were saying was basically if we don't start thinking now and, and making rules basically about how we rebuild Ukraine after all this is over um, and if we don't think about what kind of country um, we want afterwards then by the time that you know the millions of dollars and euros and so forth start flowing in and they're already flowing in but um, I'm sure there'll be lots of pledging conferences and so forth once the war finally ends um, but by that time it'll be too late and I thought that was interesting because I thought that in a sense Ukraine might be a, a test case of some of the things that we are trying to do in, in Europe too, because of course we, we know that the way in which we live is not sustainable and that we need to make a transition to more sustainable energy, to a different type of economy. Um, and I think it was interesting that they were already thinking about once that money starts coming in, we want to make sure that it's used sustainably and that um, the, the, the things or the, 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 the buildup of, of the country is done in a 21st century kind of way. Um, 
And I, I commend them for already thinking about that because what I told them too as well, um, when I think about war in Ukraine, you know, I, I feel like I can't even think that far ahead. I just feel like the, the violence absolutely has to stop. What on earth can we do to make it stop? Um, and beyond that, you know, how can we make sure that there's enough money, um, you know, to, to make sure people can return, to make sure that there's food and, and, and that there are, are, are in, uh, that there's infrastructure. So to me, it was interesting to, to see that they were already thinking about this. And I was impressed that they already are, because I think that it is absolutely true. If we don't think about it now, then um, it, it'll, it'll be too late. And then I think that that for a long time to come, um, that they might suffer from from building thing, everything up very, very quickly. Um, as in, you know, then if there's not, not, a, not a master plan, then afterwards, it's very, very hard to, 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 to steer things back into where you want it to go. So um, those are those are some of my thoughts of this morning. But to be honest, it's still a, you know, a work in process. I don't know, Damien, what you uh, what you took away. Um, yeah, um, I'll just be very quick because I see Javier also raises and uh, but um, I mean, I just uh, checked my notes again. <laughs> and to your point of rebuilding this country while it's in war, I mean, they said that 50% of jobs are lost, 60% of GDP loss, 30% of companies are closed and another 20 or 30, I didn't really hear this, are um, not operating. So that, I mean, this is just to show that like the whole economy is completely in like broken now and um, the biggest employers and also super important for the, the economy as a whole are these steel mills and one of them is the one in Mariupol where currently they are fighting you know with the last uh, marines or whatever they're called against like the, the Russians so I mean so they're they're both not operating um, and they estimate the damage they can't really but like at, at least a trillion US dollars so this is the amount of, uh, you know, destruction that we are talking about. And so this country would in any case be a complete, uh, you know, rebuilding case in, in, a, in, a, in a way. And so to, to know that this is the case already, but they're at the same time fighting a new offensive by the Russian uh, forces. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, yeah, it, it's shocking. And I think what obviously made me feel super shitty is sorry for the like, <laughs> is that uh, my government is one of the key reasons why we're not uh, supporting in the ways that we could both when it comes to weaponry which would actually help the you know the, the forces on the ground and second when it comes to uh, yeah, drying out is probably the better word uh, the the russian economy so that they can't uh, like afford this war for too long um, and when it comes to the sanctions on gas and and, and oil and uh, coal so i mean that, that obviously didn't make me feel very good. Uh, but in, anyways, I'm trying to push my government already <laughs> for some time. So let's see. it gives me more emotional um, strength. I think that's also what Lyra meant, uh, or like what I, what I hear, which is like, obviously, it, you know, it takes you, you see these people in front of you and then you get a more motivation even to, to somehow do something. Sorry for the long intervention. Uh, that's okay. Um, I can see Javier has the, the raised his hand, but before we let him speak, um, I think Clara asked you, Lara, uh, about the uh, women you were meeting. She said, was this meeting with Maria Metzenseva? I think it's pronounced. It's in the chat. The name is in the chat, if you want to check. Uh, no, it was with Lesia Vasilenko and with, um, I'm going to say Anya, but Alina, Alina yeah. Think, no? yeah. Uh, sh sh uh, is it a surname that I couldn't that I couldn't quite pronounce? But I can uh, I can tell you right now. Uh, Shkrum was her Al Ali Alina or Aliona Shkrum and uh, Lesia Vasilenko. Those were the members that we met. <laughs> that's okay. Thank you. And that's the beauty of Europe, right? Um, our surnames are so diverse that we struggle to uh, you know pronounce them. Um, so, <laughs> right, uh, Javier. Uh, if you want to go, uh, you can uh, turn on your camera and, uh, you know, give your question. Yes. Uh, hello and thank you for coming <laughs> for this. Uh, my question may change a bit the topic, but actually, I believe you can even also apply it actually to the war in Ukraine. Um, I was reading about assessing the Europeans, the Euro Europe's performance in with the pandemic crisis. And it talk, the article talked about three aspects that, like three criteria that we have to analyze, which were whether the existing tools uh, for the crisis management were correctly used, 
whether the EU was able to anticipate the secondary effects of the waves of the pandemic. And what I'm really interested in was whether the EU has been projecting an image of competence, communicating well about the crisis and its management. And I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you believe about the European Union's communication campaigns, uh, how they use them as how they could use them better, because I believe they are also a great tool to fight against nationalism. And even now in the war against of Ukraine, I believe it's a good tool that actually the both governments have been using against each other and that the EU may have a really feeble uh, communication campaign from what I've experienced for the last years. You want me to go first? Okay, um, uh, happy to. So first of all, I don't know. Like, I think the EU doesn't have great communication tools, so I don't. I don't think that they, you know that that's really going to make a difference. Uh, and I don't think actually the European Parliament should invest in this so much. Maybe the European Commission. We can discuss this, but um, but I'm um, sorry. I just need to turn this here off. So, but on the on the health, I mean. It's absolutely simple, you know, the European Union has almost no competence when it comes to health policy. So now we saw a pandemic, uh, now we can potentially discuss, and I think we should discuss, if there is a need for some competences on the European level, yeah? um, if the European medical agency should have higher competences, but or if we should have, you know, more crisis uh, tools. And I'm not a health policy expert, um, and I know that there are like some opaque bodies um, there already, but I, I don't think we have a very functioning and structured um, pandemic response uh, on the European level. And there are great ideas in the in the scientific world about uh, zoning, you know, like that you actually try to, if if something comes up, you can have like a kind of a, an, a, what do you call it, a traffic light system of saying, okay, here's a lot of lockdown because there's a, a very high numbers and so on, but you do this across Europe to somehow allow for an easier response and uh, I think the first point the second point is the vaccination um, buying I think was a, as a, it's a bit weird but I think it was a huge success yeah and um, because you basically ma managed that countries are not bidding against each other when it is about life and death but they, they actually you know bid together as a European Union and um, but the way that this was handled is I think important for you to understand also when you think about the criticism that was there when it comes to the contracts that were made so since it's not a European Union competence to buy vaccines, there was a weekly steer call, meaning like a steering committee meeting with the health ministers of all the countries, where the European Commission would basically update them and get new decisions of what they should be doing. And so, for example, the decision to buy a certain French uh, potential vaccine product uh, to procure that and decrease BioNTech was driven by the French health minister. And then later on, you know, von der Leyen was asked, like, why did you buy, you know, so much of this French stuff and not like the BioNTech more? That wasn't her decision. And I think that's uh, also explained. And then with this, I would also stop. Explains why it's so important to fix European democracy, because you need to make the people electable that take democratic, uh, that take decisions that affect all of us. And you need to make sure that, you know, that there's a direct um, somehow, uh, you know, line between the voters and, and this person that is taking a decision. Yeah? So normally what should happen is if the pressure rises, the European Parliament should say, actually like this health minister, we, you know, we don't trust this, uh, this guy or this woman anymore. Um, we would ask for their resignation or something like this. And um, I mean, this could happen then, but definitely in the next elections, you would say, honestly, like this conservative liberal coalition government was really shitty when it came to the pandemic. I would have really liked to have a more social democratic, uh, I don't know, Green government because they feel more as if in control and then you could in the next election actually change that government and this is really what we need so clear competences but also the 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 power for these governments on the european level to actually do stuff um without being stopped by the national level constantly and and, and then basically elections that allow you to directly via european parliament elect these people yeah? i mean that's a bit like uh, what i think is necessary Lara, do you have anything to add to this question? No, I think that we don't have all that much time. So I think Daniel said yeah. it uh, said it well. Let's uh, let's let's go to uh, to someone else or to another question. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to add that um, you know we an association we agree with you. Uh, spoke to many members and we believe the EU should invest more in marketing 
because um, we don't know that like, the EU does so many things and, you know, we help spread the word, uh, but just people don't know it. They don't know, you know, all these European funds or what we're doing or the laws that are passing to protect us or data. Most people don't know about this. You know, they only hear the bad stuff, the local, the national governments, uh, you know, politicians say. So maybe the communication works well, but you should invest more in marketing. So, uh, you know, have a chat in the parliament. Maybe you can improve that. <laughs> Clara, if you want to go and um, ask your question. Sure, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, Lara and Damien, for, for joining. But uh, this question is, I think it's more for Damien. Uh, it's regarding the electoral law. Um, if it passes, and I really hope it does, uh, do you expect any reluctance from some member states? And also building on the question by Javier on the communication of the EU, how do you think the EU should uh, communicate this new law and uh, counter all this uh, reluctance from certain member states. Thank you. Um, I, I guess Lara also has to leave on time. I have a bit more time uh, afterwards. So maybe if there's another question, um, I will write down your question about the electoral law and um, the communication around it. I don't know if there's another question for Lara um, and then I can, I'm happy to. Okay, let me, let me check. So Lara, you have to leave a uh, help us, right? In, in just two minutes. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just going to check. Uh, is, does anyone have any questions for Lara specifically, or uh, is, she, is she free to go? All right, we, we don't want to keep you. We don't have to. <laughs> Let me just... I have a question for Lara. Go on. Regarding, yeah. Since you said that you also worked on, on anti-corruption, uh, what do you think about the whistleblowers regulation that hasn't been really implemented in almost any country, although the time has passed to do so. Um, how would it help? Good question. I, yeah, I think you might know more about that than me because I have never worked on it. Um, and I've heard about it in passing, of course, um, but I don't, uh, I don't know the details of it. So if you tell me that we've passed it, but it's not being implemented, then I believe you. The only thing I can say about it is that within the, the law that I'm working on on responsible businesses. So businesses, um, the, the bigger businesses we're talking about here, so multinationals with complex uh, value chains across the world and so forth. Um, what I have put in that proposal is to make very sure that whistleblowers um, are protected and that they are listened to. And so that if you have um, locally uh, people working in a, a, a certain factory or a few NGOs who are trying to, to show that there is environmental degradation going on or that illegally um, there's, there's logging and, and, and trees are being chopped down. Um, in practice, in, in, in some of these situations, um, it is hugely dangerous for people to speak out, right? Um, and when you look at, at some of the countries where, where, where the worst of these practices are ongoing, there is so many, uh, there's, there's, there's bribery and corruption and there's, there's danger in people saying, but we don't want uh, another tree to be chopped down or we, we, um, we want to, to be paid for the work that we do and for the overtime we do. Um, and that power imbalance needs to be addressed. And so what I find very important there, aside from making sure that workers and trade unions have a voice is that there's, um, that there's a protection for whistleblowers and that there's entry points, let's say, for whistleblowers to say within companies um, that, something's, that something's going on. And I think within Boeing, I mean, the example um, that I had before about this, this Netflix documentary that I very much advise you to, to watch, um, I think that if there, there, there had been uh, better whistleblowing, uh, whistleblower protection, uh, that perhaps the outcome would have been different. I don't know the details there. I know that people try to say, uh, look, what we're doing here is we're building a, a plane that's not safe. Um, but I think those kind of examples show that there can be real human suffering and real um, environmental degradation if we if we don't protect people from speaking out. So that's my bit uh, in this that I'm that I'm trying to do. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I don't know if there are any more questions for Lara. Otherwise, uh, you know, she can go. I, I mean, I understand you, you guys are busy. It's the end of the day, right? Uh, 7.30 if you're in Brussels is quite late. <laughs> so. Especially if you have a, also a child. So I'm very impressed, Lara. Indeed. Thank you so much. If you're <laughs> like this, yeah. 
<laughs> You're very welcome. It was my it was my pleasure, and I will leave you in the uh, the capable yeah. hands of uh, of Damien then. And uh, if I could just repeat his call, uh, absolutely one go and vote, but two also consider joining a political party because in order to change things, you need to create power together and you need to organize yourselves. Um, and I think that uh, the European Parliament in Europe um, can uh, can use some more uh, pro-European young people. So uh, so absolutely go and uh, and think about that. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you, Lara. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, Clara, your question was um, about the electoral law. No, like well, the second part, I remember how to communicate it better, but the first part, I forgot. Well, it's mainly on the like how certain countries are going to react to it because I, I expect not every member state to be extremely happy about it or not every government to be very happy about it. And so how would you then uh, first, like change the narrative or the communication according to that? Um, I, so what I'm currently doing is that I'm talking already to uh, all the permanent representation. So basically the, you know, the embassies uh, of the different countries in Brussels to the European Union. Um, and I basically tried to explain what we thought about and like basically say like, look, this is how this, the second vote system would work. This is how voting age 16 would work and so on, like all the different parts that are like uh, in this law that we negotiated. Um, and there you can already see that the Nordics are quite skeptical of any form of second vote. Um, they don't like that so much. Um, I think Poland and Hungary is like the typical, you know, uh, naysayers. We will see. I, I don't know if Poland is going to be so much against it. And, and Hungary, it's a bit difficult to say how, you know, Orban will now act after being strengthened so much by the last elections. So it's, uh, it's a bit no, let's see. But on the other side, we have a lot of countries who are actually quite um, interested. So, I mean, Spain, Germany, Italy, France, depending on this week's election again, <laughs> um, and, and so on. And that, that's also not nothing. Yeah? And Belgium and like some others. I think there are uh, some champions and what will need to happen is that they have a debate um, and then uh, we will see. We will uh, try to push. There won't be any form of official communication into these countries um, by the European Parliament or anyone. So I think what's also important is that we on the political level, we talk to all of these uh, stakeholders and try to explain and go to the, I'm going to do also country capital tour to somehow, you know, go even into the parliaments and explain a bit what, what we meant with this law. Um, but I think at some point, um, we might also need some public pressure uh, to ensure that this is happening. And um, so I guess like, if we vote in two weeks, that means that um, like over the next months, they will start discussing this and then towards fall and, and spring next year, I think we should really uh, think about, about ramping up some, some pressure on our governments. Yeah. But in the end, sorry to say this, but like, you know, do we get in Hungary enough support to actually pressure the government? Because I would potentially get, you know, momentum, uh, which is a pro-European party in Hungary to, to support this, but uh, Orban doesn't care about them. So, you know, like, I don't know. And in Spain, I think you already have a quite positive government. So I don't uh, see so much of a need necessarily from, from the Spanish perspective. Thank right. you. Thank you for that. Um, I know we've just gone above the time. So, um, Look, I uh, understand if, if you gotta go, I just wanted to ask you very quickly uh, for a piece of advice. Okay. So, uh, you know, what, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, briefly what we do, uh, you know, we um, encourage the youth to get more involved in European affairs. Uh, we spread the word of the European Union. We also plant in trees, as you know, with our campaign, you know, that's just one of our campaigns. We do many other stuff. Um, what advice would you give us, you know, um, to be more, to be more active and part of the change that we want to create, you know, to more towards this European integration, more, you know, unity in, in diversity, right? That's our motto. So, uh, what advice would you give us? So, um, you know, from your point of view, since you are in the Parliament. So, um, so I give a, a class on um, change, basically on. on organizing change um, and tomorrow I have a next installment <laughs> so my advice is a bit like coming obviously from my own experience uh, and I think what 
really helps, and this is a bit of a weird point, but is to have your theory of change completely pinned down. Yeah? Like to be a bit analytical about and a bit harsh to yourself and saying, what do I actually want to do and how is this going to affect the result that I want to have? Um, and that can be a very micro result of saying like, look, I want to get at least 15,000 people out there um, to get them to know Europe a bit and then this will be part of their formation and then you know they whatever they do after we will see but it will increase the likelihood of people actually getting active and so on so i mean and that's a very good theory of change yeah and that's measurable and that i think is helpful if you say like look we want to have a measurable impact on the integration of the european union that's very broad yeah? that's a, a quite a broad goal if i want if you want um, and I don't know, but this is, in, in my case for Boyle, this is our goal. And the theory of change is super simple. We try to steal on every country, we try to steal uh, seats from other parties uh, so that they have to relate to us. And then hopefully, you know, say, okay, these idiots from the pro-European side, they're stealing our votes. We need to get our program to be more pro-European so that they don't steal our votes. I mean, that's very simply put. Uh, <laughs> You know our theory of change and then obviously if you get elected and we can do positive stuff to integrate that is also then you know we, if we can do the policies ourselves then it's obvious obviously we can also do the change yeah so that's a bit like for me i always saw it like this you know you, you need to be come so annoying and you can only be annoying if you're also in the political field a bit um that you need to steal the seat so what is your theory of change i mean i would have to think about it but as i said um i think if you say that it's sufficient for you to just, um, you know, that the, the members that you are having are the goal of the organization, which is to say, like, everyone who is actually part of these discussions might not forget them, might keep them with them and take them amongst, you know, all the impressions that they have on their path. I think that's very good. Uh, and then it's obviously always helpful to think about, you know, when you have specific campaigns, uh, What's the call to action and what's the urgency? Yeah? Like, why is this? Not, why are the trees needed now? And what do you want people to do when, when, once they see these trees? Or you know, what do you want people to do once they see you tweeting about it? So, like, yeah, I think. Uh, sorry, I can talk about this kind of stuff for hours, <laughs> but uh, very simply put, I think you need to have your theory of change uh, clear. What is it that you actually want to achieve? And this should be measurable, because I think only because we're doing good stuff doesn't mean we shouldn't be as precise as people who work in the private sector or whatever. So measurable um, theory of change. Um, I think you should, uh, when you do actions and activities, think about you know the urgency and the call to action uh, to ensure that you actually reach that theory of change. Anyway, sorry, a bit nerdy, but uh, <laughs> I think you know you can also hush this all aside uh, because obviously when we started, while well, we didn't, you know really think everything is <laughs> through uh, neither so i think it's also good to value the fact that you're just active and you you try to contribute and this is i think it, that's the most important point because obviously there you know okay one more anecdote <laughs> but, <laughs> on. but like um since we uh, you know since building this movement i have had like thousands of people not thousands but like a, a couple of hundred people saying like oh yeah i also wanted to start a party you know, but there's a difference between saying that and thinking about wanting to start a party or doing it. Yeah? I just happened to be with this one guy who was crazy enough to do it. And then I just went with him. But I think that's why it's already cool that you're here and that you started this. What you're starting because you're doing something and, and see yourself not as a passive observer of the world around you, but, uh, you know, that you're actually engaging and understanding that you have power to change stuff. And that's really, I think, the, the crucial thing. We all have power to change stuff because that's how democracy is built. You know, like if you convince mm -hmm. enough people of a certain idea, then it will change because we still have, uh, at least in some European countries, uh, a functioning democracy. So that's that's uh, yeah. probably the last point. Sorry. No, that's okay. Well, thank you very much for the advice. I'm, you know, I'm glad that you think we're on the right track, <laughs> and we, and I'm glad this is recorded because I want to share this with uh, with my colleagues in the you know the association. Uh, we'll definitely get back to this. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know. I mean, we have gone oof, 11 minutes beyond. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you have more time or we could just uh, end it here. I um, now I, I need to also head out. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I, thanks a lot. No, no, no. Look, I perfectly understand. And thank you very much for taking the time. I know you guys have a very, very busy agenda. Uh, you know, it's been an honor. 
to be part of this meeting. And um, yeah, thank you very much for sharing your, your insights. And um, yeah, well, hopefully in the future we'll, we'll have another event together. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.